So, it's the summer of 1914, and you're a young gentleman fresh from Sandhurst, or perhaps university, and you've just been gazetted to your regiment. You might already have some kit from your time training, but you can't turn up looking like a cadet. So, it's off to your nearest tailor and military outfitter to spend an extortionate amount of money on looking like a soldier. The first thing an officer needed to buy was a basic service dress uniform. This consisted of a jacket, breeches or knickerbockers, and the cap worn by their regiment. The officer's service dress jacket was made in a variety of fabrics, but the most common options were serge, the cheapest, whipcord, the most hard-wearing, and barathea, the warmest and most expensive. Khaki shirts and collars were also made from a variety of materials, including wool flannel and linen. Breeches or knickerbockers were usually made from serge or bedford cord and may have had leather reinforcements for riding. Cavalry and infantry breeches tended to differ slightly in cut, with the cavalry versions being cut wider for riding and the infantry ones being slimmer for marching, but there was often a good deal of leeway as to what was allowed for wear in the field. In Highland regiments, of course, a kilt of regimental pattern made of at least five yards of heavy wool was worn, with a silk binding and occasionally a decorative fringe. The cap and collar badges were usually purchased from a jeweller, and were either bronze or silver and gilt, depending on the regiment. A stout pair of boots, or shoes in Highland regiments, were essential, and often these would be made from a tracing of the officer's foot or a custom measurement, in order to ensure a perfect fit. For dismounted officers, khaki putties were worn, and many officers swore by popular brands such as Foxes or Boyd's. For mounted officers, leather gaiters of the Stovasser pattern were required. In Highland regiments, dismounted officers wore gaiters and hose tops, and each regiment had its own pattern. A pair of brown dogskin or buckskin gloves completed the service dress uniform. With the basic uniform covered, the officer then needed to purchase his field equipment. The Sam Brown equipment was ubiquitous throughout all arms of service and consisted of a belt, two braces, a pistol case, ammunition pouch and sword frog. To this the officer would have to add a water bottle and map compass and field glasses cases of authorised commercially available patterns. A haversack to carry the daily ration was also needed, and there were a great variety of patterns available. One enterprising company even designed a haversack to which a small chair was attached, but perhaps unsurprisingly, it didn't catch on. A carrier for the greatcoat was recommended but many junior officers elected to carry the coat and other items in a pack instead. The great coat itself was of the universal pattern, with coloured piping on the shoulder straps denoting the officer's armour service. It was made of heavy, waterproofed wool and was fitted with regimental buttons and gilding metal. This was usually one of the most expensive items of uniform. In addition to this, Many officers also equipped themselves with a waterproof, which would later come to be referred to as a trench coat. Burberry, Thresher and Glenny, and Aquascutum were among the most popular makers, and the price for something that was actually waterproof was always high. Of course, it was no use having field equipment with nothing to put in it. One of the most important and symbolic purchases in this regard was the officer's sword. This would be of the pattern used by his regiment or armour service, and would be worn in dress uniforms and carried in war. In addition, he would need a good pair of field glasses or a telescope, a compass, wire cutters, and of course a pistol. Any commercial pattern of pistol was permitted, as long as it used government issue ammunition. Wristwatches had become compulsory by 1914, 
and many companies produced watches designed for the rigours of active service, often with metal guards over the face. Eventually, these would come to be known as trench watches, but their origin lay in the days before trench warfare. Everything mentioned so far was worn by the officer or carried on their person, but a lot more was required before they would be ready to go to war. Each officer was allowed £35 of baggage to be carried in their unit's transport, and almost every ounce of that allowance was taken up with essential items. Firstly, they needed something to sleep on, and for this a sleeping valise was commonly used. These were made of canvas, and usually contained a sleeping bag or blanket, and a mattress. Inflatable mattresses were becoming increasingly popular, but solid mats made of cork, wool or kapok were also used. An extra luxury in the form of an inflatable pillow could be added if desired. Contained in the valise, the whole bed could be rolled up and stowed away at a moment's notice, or unrolled quickly at the end of a long march. The valise was often also used to carry the rest of the equipment which comprised the baggage allowance. The recommended contents were a spare pair of boots and putties, a canvas bucket, washing equipment, a sewing kit, a folding lantern or torch, canvas shoes, spare socks and underwear, and a complete spare set of service dress. In addition, officers would also provide themselves with a metal mug and plate and cutlery, which were not included in the baggage allowance. This covers the basic uniform and equipment that an officer required for active service. However, there were also a plethora of extra items and comforts which many purchased or were gifted, varying from the practical to the ridiculous. Thermos flasks, small spirit stoves and cooking outfits were often added to the basic kit, as at the start of the war there was no official plan to provide officers with cooked food. In winter, various waterproof items were seen, ranging from leather socks and underwear to silk ground sheets and waders. A new officer going on active service, therefore, required a great many items of uniform and equipment, and this came with a large price tag. The total for the compulsory items discussed in this video, using contemporary advertisements and price lists from the main military outfitters, was between 50 and 60 pounds which would be over £6,000 today. But remember, this was just the service kit. In future videos, we'll look at all the other orders of dress a regular army officer had to provide himself with, as well as the culture and expense of life in the officer's mess, and so get a better idea of just how difficult it was to live as an officer in the Edwardian era.